A lot of people eat pancakes the day before Lent. This is a major trend around the world, and I hadn't heard of it until a few years ago. Lent always starts with Ash Wednesday, so the Tuesday before that is when we eat pancakes. And you might have heard it called Shrove Tuesday, or Fat Tuesday, or Pancake Day. And it seems a little hypocritical on the surface. Lent is a season of fasting, so let's stuff our faces with pancakes before Lent starts. But the theological significance of this phenomenon might surprise you and you'll definitely want to stick around for a surprise I'm cooking up. But to get there, we have to understand what Lent is. So I sat down with my pastor, Ian, to talk about why this season is part of the liturgical year. So Lent is one of actually two different seasons, preparatory seasons, seasons of preparation that we have. Um, you'll often hear people refer to Lent as a penitential season, and that's true because penitence was part of our preparation, right? So it, does, it developed as this season of getting ready for the Feast of Easter, the Feast of the Resurrection. Fasting is a part of Lent because it's part of the sort of natural rhythm of life, or meant to be part of this natural rhythm of life, and certainly part of the rhythm of life that's embodied in our liturgical calendar. So we have it built in periods of feasting and of fasting, and in order to emphasize and heighten and, and, and make more exciting and more um, majestic and more glorious those feast days, we often have periods of fasting in preparation for them. So we have this period of fasting where we sort of go without things and usually it's good things and that's what distinguishes fasting from self-help regimen or, you know, or, or a diet or something like that is that fasting is usually going without something that's really good, something that's really God-given, something that we are meant to appreciate, in order that when those feasts do come and we sort of re-engage with them, uh, with those good things, that we appreciate them all the more. The idea is that by taking away even some of those good things, even some of the things that we appreciate, we're able to focus more on what's actually essential. And we come to understand how, how sufficient God's goodness is and how little we need some of the things that we feel like we can't do without. If you have something good, something that you love every single day, then event eventually it sort of loses its luster. Eventually it's not quite as special. If every day is special, then no day is special, right? And so having periods where we go without certain things, even certain things that we really enjoy, actually helps us to appreciate those things more. Um, it's one of the only ways to sort of get back to that original sense of joy that you get from something that's good. If you've watched my channel before, you know that I love food and I'm always talking about why feasting is important. But feasting alone isn't enough for a robust theology of food. Not every day is a feast day. We also need times of fasting. The goodness of feasting and the goodness of fasting don't invalidate each other. And actually the interplay between feasting and fasting enhances the benefits of each one. But some of you might be thinking, didn't Jesus say his disciples don't need to fast? Yes. Yes. In Matthew 9 and parallel accounts, Jesus is asked why the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees fast, but his disciples don't fast. And his answer is that the wedding guests can't fast while the bridegroom is with them. This image of a marriage to describe the relationship between God and his people is used throughout the Old Testament and it's carried on into the new. The Lord is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Jesus is saying that while he's there in the flesh, it's a time for celebration. But when he leaves, then his disciples will fast. Jesus isn't speaking against fasting, but is just addressing the proper time for fasting. We know that Jesus wasn't opposed to fasting because he gives instructions in Matthew chapter 6 that begin, when you fast, which assumes that his listeners will be fasting at some point. And we also have a record of Jesus himself fasting for 40 days, which is actually part of where the 40 days of fasting during Lent comes from. I asked Ian how we should think about practicing fasting today. And I thought he had some great advice, so let's head back in. First things first, if you're going to fast, pick something that you have an unabashedly joyful relationship with. If you have a complicated relationship with food, like if you have a history of eating disorders or anything like that, fasting can, can do spiritual damage, right? Because 
things don't get less complicated when you tie ideas of God up with them, right? So pick something that you genuinely love and really, really, truly love. And you don't have to go 40 days without it, especially if it's something that you're used to every single day. Have a planned period of time that you're going to fast from it. So don't just say, I'm gonna stop doing this. Circle a date on the calendar when you're going to pick that back up and look forward to that and anticipate that and see if that helps you view this more as part of God's providence, helps give you greater joy around engaging in this, um, and, and makes you more clearly see God's presence in your life through this, this good thing. As we head into Lent, you should think about how you might practice fasting this season in preparation for Easter. And with all this in mind, we can understand a little bit better why people eat pancakes before Lent. Shrove Tuesday is all about getting ready for Lent. There's the practicality of pancakes using up things that you might be fasting from during Lent, like eggs, dairy, sugar, so those things don't go to waste. But there's more to it than that. The name Shrove Tuesday comes from the English word shrive, which refers to confessing sins and receiving absolution. And this name was given to the Tuesday before Lent because repentance was considered an important part of preparing oneself for Lent. Essentially, Shrove Tuesday helps us start to lean into Ash Wednesday when our need for repentance is foregrounded. This connection is even stronger in some churches that will burn the palms from last year's Palm Sunday to create the ashes that will be used the next Next day on Ash Wednesday. And lastly, Shrove Tuesday is a time to feast as a reminder that the things we're fasting from aren't bad things. It's good to enjoy God's gifts to us, and it's good to fast from those things for a time so we can more vividly recognize God as the source of all good things. Pancakes are great, but maybe you want to try something different this year. This smells amazing. I recently learned about these Swedish cardamom buns called semla that are eaten before Lent for the same reasons. In Sweden, they're only sold during a specific window of time. They're rich and tasty, and they have the potential to use up some ingredients people might be fasting from during Lent. It's basically a cardamom brioche bun that's hollowed out, filled with almond paste, and topped with whipped cream. Someone has even created a hybrid of semla and Swedish princess cake, which I might have to try making in the future because I love making the princess cake. And while we're getting ready for Lent, you should check out this video where I illustrate an aspect of the Christian life through fermentation. Because if you're not living out this principle, it's gonna be harder for you to draw near to God during Lent. Wow, that's amazing. You should make these.